Greetings, and thank you for joining us for another SANS ICS Concept Overview. I'm Don C. Weber of Cutaway Security and a certified SANS instructor. In this Concept Overview, we're joined by Ron Fabella from Sin Saber to talk about considerations when writing and reading vulnerability disclosure information when related to control environment technologies. If you enjoyed this video and the topics we cover in the SANS ICS Concept Overviews, be sure to like and subscribe to this channel. Leave a comment if you have a question about this topic or suggestions for future content. Hello everybody, thanks for joining us for another SANS ICS Concept video. This time I'm joined by Ron Fabella from Sin Saber. And I've asked Ron here to talk to us about a vulnerability disclosure for software, hardware devices that are deployed within control networks, uh, because I've been hearing this vernacular uh, from um, uh, recent information or recent vulnerability disclosures uh, that concern me associated with how they're written up, also how they're talking about mitigations or not talking about mitigations, which is the biggest concern, um, and how it's being represented in the media because a part of the control network information security professionals job is to help uh, people understand uh, vulnerability disclosures um, and uh, kind of suppress some of the hyperbole um, that uh, kind of just feeds into the media. So Ron, you've, you've got a lot of experience. I don't even know where to start. So can you introduce yourself <laughs> and uh, um, Sin Saber and, and let people know what your background is? Sure. Thanks, Don. Now, uh, uh, Ron Fabella, uh, CTO and co-founder of Sin Saber, but before Sin Saber, you know, really, my background was in uh, risk assessments, compliance. You know, NERC-SIP was kind of the gateway drug for all of us way back. Uh, but a lot of in-the-field work on production systems, so oil and gas, electric utilities, advising asset owners as to what to do with findings, vulnerabilities, compliance concerns in a practical way. And that's kind of, you know, what we're going to discuss now is, uh, you know, with that background in the field and now as a, as a product vendor in the OT uh, asset discovery and, and monitoring space, you know, how do we bring that practical knowledge that we have in the field back to customers, back to asset owners in, in a way that is codified in technology? So that way we're just not constantly bombarding them with more services or, you know, more things. You know, how can we empower them to go off on their own? and handle these in a way that's scalable and, and attainable. And when we talk about industrial control system vulnerability reporting, you know, back before CISA was CISA and it was ICS cert, you know, independent researchers, that that was the, the third party that you could go through and safely disclose or responsibly disclose. Uh, you know, uh, we were talking earlier, like back in the day, in the old days of DEF CON and the old days of S4, uh, a researcher getting a CND wasn't uncommon. So they provided that that interface, that that safe interface, and what we've seen now, as uh, more OEMs, more independent researchers, and now even security vendors are disclosing vulnerabilities they discover, it's becoming more mainstream. the The metrics from a pure metric side are increasing, and to your point, media, uh, government, uh, executive branch, they're starting to take notice, and maybe they're starting to come to some incorrect conclusions that hopefully we can educate the audience and say, hey, you know, here's why we're still talking about vulnerability disclosure in, in industrial or patching. You know, mm -hmm. these seem to be solved problems. And there are nuances to industrial control systems that have to be taken into account. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of, uh, you know, uh, you know, there, there's this trend in the industry um, and it's not even on the control network side. It's actually leaking into the control network side, uh, mm -hmm. which is the named vulnerability. You know, some researcher doing something, uh, uh, identifying things uh, and or identifying a lot of things. I, gu I guess the uh, the ice fall is, uh, you know, the best example right now uh, of mm -hmm. the most currently named vulnerabilities or a group of vulnerabilities. Um, I I like the media attention a little bit around that, as long as they are hitting some of the uh, uh, concerns that I have around providing the proper mitigation uh, recommendations and helping people understand. I mean, I, I don't think that uh, um, uh, some of the people, I mean, obviously the, how to write a, a vulnerability disclosure um, is, a, is a practice. So um, mm -hmm. what, what do you think around the named vulnerability disclosures and so forth? 
It's tough because, you know, I used to work in government and large organizations, and sometimes until you put a cool name and logo on something, it doesn't get the attention it deserves. So I understand that. There's also a drive from a marketing stance. You know, we want to get the awareness. So it's not so much, I mean, we can be jaded and kind of be like, not everything needs a cool name and logo, but I understand now how that helps. I think really um, what we're seeing, and, and and we can pick on Icefall a little bit, uh, you know, from a technical stance, the report was great. And when you read through the report, it provided a lot of things that you don't typically see, like the his, the history behind it. Um, they actually mentioned S4, Project Base Camp, Insecure by Design. So there, it's very well-read, well-researched, and the context is there. Um, I think we can maybe discuss, like, you know, uh, is there a benefit to the community not just the, the marketing side, but in an education, but is there a benefit to the community in releasing CVEs that have to be triaged and managed for things that are never going to be fixed or the, you know, the forever day as, as Reed and, and Sister Trump used to call it. Right. You know, so bringing that term back into the fold, it's uh, the reason why, you know, I, I'm starting to use that now is because the general public doesn't understand that concept. And for you and me, it's kind of old, but there's these things in industrial, like, are CS, CVSS scores really accurate? Um, you know, what about patching cycles? What about vendor approvals? Uh, these are things that are foreign to maybe the enterprise security side because they're, they're solved problems that we still have to consider and struggle with in ICS. And so when something like ISWAL comes out, uh, the technical geek in me goes, wow, that was a great report. They referenced all my friends and all the cool things I remember, and like it's very detailed, and you kind of feel like they really understand. And then, then you go to the CISA side, and they go, oh, "Wow, they have to address this because it was made public." There were, I think, fifty-six different CVEs, um, and then then you think, "What happens when the director of security at my local utility now gets this? Right? What's their process procedure?" How do they look at this and what are the things that could be done to make their life easier? Because I think that's where we're at as an industry now. We have a seat at the table. We're being taken seriously. Uh, asset owners uh, have budget. They have board level focus on it. Now we can't fumble the execution, right? And that's really where I wanted to focus on with the vulnerabilities and disclosures. It's not so much as ah, CVSS sucks and what is a forever day. It's just more of how do how can we start to tailor these things to make them you know, uh, uh, measurable, attainable, and easier for us and owners to implement. So, yeah, I mean, you you, you make a good point, in, and I kind of want to dive into the the CVSS score, meaning that the the, the score that's associated with the uh, um, criticality of the vulnerability associated with its exploitability, and mm -hmm. certainly when we some see some of these devices that have uh, management interfaces uh, and uh, either without credentials or hard coded credentials. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times that provides the, uh, when you actually go through the scoring mechanism and you think about it from the standpoint of this on a normal network, uh, you get a high rating, you know, somewhere between nine and 10, um, which absolutely means that, hey, you need to prioritize uh, the remediation of this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, part of the, my concerns around that is, is that people are taking those scores uh, without taking into consideration the environment that, that it's deployed in, meaning that, yes, that remote exploitability is still there, um, but when it's deployed within a specific part of the network and you've got uh, um, network architecture that is uh, put in place, you've got proper ACLs and so forth, uh, the mitigating controls have actually reduced uh, that score uh, associated with where it's deployed, but the media doesn't doesn't really understand that. It's not their job to understand that. Um, uh, but they, so they're not going to reevaluate it because it's inconsistent from deployment to deployment. So what, what are your cons uh, considerations around that and your recommendations for how organizations can move forward uh, to understand uh, or reassess uh, these scores? Yeah, CVSS, I think, is a good first start. But to your point, there are other considerations and even version two tried to take these environmental controls into consideration. Um, the, the big thing with CVSS, though, is that it's just up to the researcher, whether it's the OEM, independent, et cetera, to go and, and identify and tick those boxes. I'm not sure CISA is going through with it, or has the time or resources to do a fine you know, review and be like, is this really require user interaction? Or 
you know, things that would influence the score. So we're kind of getting it at face value. The environmentals, like you said, a lot of it is, it, this is the old military enclave approach, right? Uh, even though these systems are interconnected, are converged, they started uh, separate, which means that the power plant, the refinery, the pipeline, mostly is still its own enclave that is now interconnected with enterprise or a third party vendor system. So you inherit all of those architectural protections, hopefully. Uh, physical security plays into a big a big part. You know, when I was a pen tester, uh, you, you would go through and, and exploit these vulnerabilities and they'd say, well, Ron, we walked you into the control center and we gave you, we opened up a port on the switch and, and you know, we like it, all these things that predicate the actual exploitation, that's hard to quantify in a CS, CBSS score. But, you know, some of the things we focused on, um, one of which is the user uh, interaction part, a lot of these vulnerabilities require at minimum some interaction from the user, either to click on a bad link or download a bad file, uh, things that are really common in enterprise uh, because the attack surface is there and the operation of enterprise, you're constantly getting email, clicking on links, you're downloading firmware or, or, or a patch or something like that's just part of the everyday experience. And in operations, it's not. So it's not that it couldn't occur and you definitely don't want to use it as an excuse not to patch, but anything that requires you to open up a system, download a file, you know, load that file into a software ap application, you're just putting more and more steps of this is an unlikely exploitation avenue. And it's easy to come back to, again, some of the guilty knowledge you and I have, which is like, why would anyone want to attack it that way? Just get on the network and send it a stop CPU command. You're, you're mm -hmm. good. Like, why would I want them to open up Inkscape and load a bad file? And like, for the purposes of what, right? Um, right. right. I think user interaction is a huge one. And um, and although there is a user interaction uh, category in CVSS, sometimes it's not always accurate. It does factor into the score. But anything that requires an operator or someone to, to have that level of interactivity, the probability of exploitation just goes, you know, it, it's really low. Um, and that's just the nature of people don't understand operating systems, industrial control. They don't have email systems. They don't necessarily have in their EWS or OWS the ability to go out to an internet, you know, via browser. Um, you know, uh, uh, most of the facilities I've been in, while it's, you know, OWS and then maybe a corporate network, they still are separated from that sense. So if they need to check weather, get email, et cetera, that's a separate system. So that mm -hmm. attack vector just isn't practical. Um, the other thing to consider too, you know, when we're looking at not just the exploit, exploitability of these vulnerabilities, because uh, again, I'm an old attacker, so I, that sometimes is my, my bias, but think of the, the management teams and the blue teams and the people that are in charge of both managing these, like in a plan of action, a milestone or reporting back because of compliance, um, there are different regulatory bodies and standards that say, as soon as something like this comes out and you have an affected product, you have X amount of days to respond as to whether or not you're going to patch. So another area of focus is really the patchability. Like, I'm not sure if these are words, they're all abilities, but you know, your ability to patch these systems varies much and, and, and there's much more variety than an enterprise. Um, I think in enterprise, we're used to like the KB approach from Windows. Hey, I don't have to upgrade from 10 to 11 to patch out these security bugs. I'll just download the latest quarterly, patch Tuesday, whatever, apply it, it fixes the security problem without impacting the functionality of the system. Well, in industrial, if there is a vulnerability in a, I had the Siemens Scalance switch uh, advisory up, they're just like, hey, upgrade to 5.2 whatever. Is that the only thing in 5.2 whatever? Is it just the security? Is there new functionality that they deprecate functionality. These are all things that when you think of more of a device level or a firmware level uh, uh, ac ability, where you're just like, I'm not going to flash the firmware just to get rid of a security bug if it's going to impact that device's functionality. So right. these are yeah, things if, that 
Because at this yeah, point, you're talking about the process. You're talking about um, you have to validate all of your code to, uh, that the program that's actually running on this uh, on the device uh, is still consistent. Um, that that firmware is compatible with all of the modules that you have installed for right. uh, additional modules that you have installed on that device. Um, uh, does the management so or does your management software, so the software that's running on your servers, is that consistent with uh, um, actually managing that as well? Uh, um, there's, it, it's not just patching a system. There's so much more to consider, uh, so much more testing. Uh, and additionally, potentially those changes could uh, have regulatory requirements for reassessing it and uh, right. uh, recertifying it. So, um, mm -hmm. and that, that's why I kind of go back to, I have this problem with them writing up that, hey, you know, look, your, your vendors aren't pushing out patches for this. You should be holding them accountable for patches when that's, you know, that's typically not the real mitigation uh, for these types of vulnerabilities. Right now, and, and OEMs could uh, could help out as well. I mean, we've all heard different horror stories of, you know, especially around forever day vulnerabilities where they just say, hey, that's a, we sunsetted that, that model, that product line. We're never going to do patches for that. Mm -hmm. Yet they still sell it. They still support it. That, you know, uh, my power is probably being run off of, you know, end of life systems right now. So it's this weird uh, tension between uh, OEMs. And when I say OEMs for, for the larger audience, it's your Siemens, your ABB, Honeywell, the people who make the systems and hardware and software that, that, that run industrial. Um, they have their own drivers. They they don't want to support a system that's been out for twenty years. They want you to upgrade to the shiny new system and rewarranty okay. and like and and because that's how they uh, through that and service contracts make their money. So there's that tension between you know we bought this five years ago. We're going to use it for another fifteen. How do we address these security issues? And unfortunately, a lot of OEMs will just say, hey, uh, either upgrade to the new hotness. Or like I was, I was looking on a Honeywell safety manager. Which, if you're looking through the advisory, uh, from the, advi the advisories from CISA, you'd go, "Wow, safety manager! That sounds important." Um, there's a exploitable real vulnerability, and their answer is, "Hey, make sure that the the switch is on the right setting. It's you know not on program. It's on run." That's what we have to deal with in industrial. They're not going to upgrade that system, ju mm -hmm. especially just for security. Um, there's also this cycle of not only, um, like you were mentioning, disrupting the interoperability. You know, these are architectures that work together. You can't just, in a vacuum, upgrade one PLC or one HMI and say, hey, we've we've addressed the security issue. A lot of times, it's all or nothing. And so you get stuck in this, um, I mentioned Enclave before, but this crunchy outer shell and GUI center where Maybe they don't patch anything and then just put more protections around physical access, logical access, et cetera. Um, the firmware, the software, and the architectural issues are really what asset owners have to consider when they see these vulnerabilities. You know, is this something where I have to rip and replace the entire architecture? And we see these in forever day vulnerabilities like, hey, Modbus doesn't have auth. Of course, Modbus doesn't have authentication. If you were to actually migrate to the secure version of Modbus or DMP3 or these other things, that's just not a, you know, double click the EXE and implement the patch. You're upending your entire architecture to make that happen. So there has to be good uh, reasoning for that. Software patches are, you know, I think a lot of folks don't realize how much enterprise is in our industrial. So when you look at like layer five down, you know, 40, 60% are Windows servers, Windows boxes. Uh, network switches, network routers. So those are opportunities, like with the Scalance uh, advisory that just came out, where you have this opportunity where you can actually patch, and it has this amplified or one-to-many effect to where, hey, if someone did gain control or DDoS uh, industrial switch, that's not just the problem for the switch, but anything else connected to it. Those are the type of risk kind of based balance that asset owners need to take. And unfortunately, it's tough when you get just hundreds and hundreds of advisors and you go, how am I supposed to pick through this and decide what's what? Right. And, you know, I I, I assisted with uh, um, uh, risk mitigation and uh, um, vulnerability management within an, uh, an enterprise environment, a very dynamic uh, media company. Um, and it was extremely difficult to uh, get that rolling and uh, um, get that mm -hmm. uh, mature. Uh, and just the added complexity of... Uh, um, the dynamics within a control environment uh, 
it just it it boggles my mind. So one of the things I try to help my my students uh, understand um, is uh, uh, prevent, uh, detect, and respond. Um, mm -hmm. So. You know, I mean, obviously we've been talking about, you know, architecture uh, um, protection, uh, but, you know, uh, what is your experience? Do you have any experience around, uh, I, I like this research, I like getting it out because mm -hmm. uh, the more we know about a vulnerability, you obviously have to communicate with it. Um, we can look at a lot of types of classes of vulnerabilities. We can mm -hmm. certainly uh, leverage tools to detect that. Um, but uh, um, certainly anything we know, we can, you know, uh, hopefully get tests from. Uh, some of my recommendations to people writing some of these is like, hey, yeah, go, you know, write a Yara rule or, or write a, um, a snort rule that would help people detect this type of activity on the network. So do you have any experience around that or what are your recommendations? Yeah, I mean, that one's big. Um, now, you see that a lot in exploitation development where you say, hey, if you're going to write an exploit, you should probably write the, the Sericata rule or the Yara rule to, to detect it. That's just good behavior as, as a citizen and um, I, I think for this, a lot of it, because it does, uh, like like Siemens, I think they were over half of the disclosures this year so far. I mean, they're just killing it as an OEM. And I think what there's different roles that can provide different values. So I think for the independent researcher, that's a good start, which is to say, what are some of the protections or mitigations? Or as an attacker, what are the, the nuisances that would make exploitation of this vulnerability just so much more difficult? Um, I used to do a lot of attack path analysis that way, where, uh, you know, in order to get down to a substation and act on objectives and disrupt power flow, I would tell customers, like, if you had just done these two things, it would have made this so much more difficult, right? Like uh, in the substation example, if you just prevented substation to substation communications, then all the cool hacker stuff I did would have been moot, right? Because I'm already at the substation. I just pull the relay out or throw some chain over the bus work, right? You know, but it's that one to many or amplified attack. So I think that is where as independent researchers or even the security vendors that are putting out these reports to say, here's our knowledge, understanding, our expertise. And here are the things that really would have made this difficult, either impossible to execute in reality or just time consuming. And that's really what we're trying to do is make this more difficult, more costly for attackers to successfully execute. So I think that's one. Um, on the OEM side, I, I find this fascinating. A lot of times they'll say, hey, upgrade to the latest version, or they'll give a, a number. Um, and then everything's hidden behind like a customer portal login. Mm -hmm. Some of them you can just like go in with your Gmail account and sign up and get the details. Some you can't. I think it would be great to help asset owners determine like, is this a, a recent thing or upgrade to 1.8? Is that that come out in 2014? I think some time bounds on these, instead mm. of just saying upgrade to the latest release, could help with um, the, the customer's interaction, the asset owner's inter interaction with their vendor. Where if they say, hey, this security vuln has been out for six years and you're just now putting out a patch and like it helps inform them and give them the tools necessary to have that conversation. Because sometimes when you read through a CISA report, you're just like, I, there's no context in this. Is this a 20 year old system? Is this a one year old system? Um, so I think that's something that OEMs could do. And then now this one's kind of, you know, if Ron ruled the world and it's not realistic at all, but wouldn't it be great if like Honeywell put out the report on safety manager, um, unless you're a Honeywell asset owner and user, is that something that's critical to the system? Is it widely used? Like does every Honeywell system have that mm -hmm. particular software package? Um, I don't think they'll ever release like, hey, you know, we have a, a million systems in the world that are vulnerable to this. But I, you'd almost hope that it would take a um, like a recall for automobile approach. You know, Toyota puts out it's this make and model from this mm -hmm. year to this year. There's 800,000 of them. Call wow. up your local guy. And like, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be great if our OEMs somehow did that? Because then you'd go, oh, wait, yeah, I have a Honeywell system, but that that's an add on. We probably don't have that, right? Or that's not critical to operations, it's supporting operations. And the OEMs have that knowledge. And so us as researchers and just our background, we could go through and go, well, yeah, my experience, that's important, but that's biased on my own observations and experience. So that'd be nice, I think, from the OEM side, they hold that knowledge. If they could release that somehow, that may be a little too unicorns and fairies, but uh, you know, that would be great, wouldn't it? Right, um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, and, and that's kind of uh, that's part of the reason why I don't mind some of the name vulnerabilities and uh, uh, you know, and obviously, in, you know, security research uh, disclosure. You know, I'm I'm mm -hmm. all for that. Um, is because it is uh, being noticed by the vendors. They are improving their processes. Mm -hmm. They are uh, bringing on the team members that understand this a lot better, and they so they have a better uh, understanding of implementation and vernacular. Uh, but still, I mean, I th I think one of the um, uh, one of the problems that we still have in this industry is that uh, there's still that division between the IT and the OT, meaning right. that the OT knows how to run the processes. They know how to deploy these technologies uh, um, so that the process uh, works, so that the, we're getting electricity or the widgets are getting made. Um, but you know, it's not the responsibility for the um, uh, for the security aspects, the the security knowledge and right. and so forth. There, there was, they're res responsible for it, but they're, you know, we want them to be ex electrical experts. They're, and they're not exactly experts. empowered or it's not their primary function to go right. through and, and so take what care your that. Experience, yeah. yeah. So what is your experience around that? And um, do you have any recommendations? Yeah, I think to, to kind of put a bow in the conversation, it, you know, we're here to empower them. And when they have a, a twice a year maintenance turn and they have the opportunity to implement some of these configuration changes, patches, et cetera. We need to arm them, make them as efficient as possible. Because to your point, uh, you know, the power plant, it's summer, it's peak load. Uh, they're not making any changes. They're not implementing anything. Not until that plant goes into an outage this fall will they have that opportunity. Now, we're fortunate in the community, like you said, it's getting attention. People are recognizing the value that security patching is even included in those maintenance turns. I mean, I mean, you and I fought that years and years ago, like, hey, please, if you're gonna shut down the plant, now's the time to change your default passwords, to implement firewall rules, you know, to do the basics. And luckily for us, patching and updates and maintenance is included in that from a security stance. So I think really how we can empower our asset owners to make best use of their time, it's again, all the abilities, this is ap applicable to them and giving them the tools, the inventory, the automatic collection to be able to quickly go, oh, Siemens Scalance, yeah, I have 10 of those in this plant. Um, that's not always a given, you know? That's not always really available. So that's step number one is, is making sure that they have that. So at a glance, they can determine the applicability. The, the patch ability is really important because not all patches are equal. So a Windows Server update that you can go through like with a KB, um, is a lot different than flashing firmware on a PLC. So starting those dividing lines, and it's kind of the 80-20 rule of, well, if I could patch 10 of my switches and get this type of risk reduction in value, um, and that takes a certain amount of man hours or woman hours, then that's better than wasting all that time and trying to flash a thousand PLCs, right? Mm -hmm. So giving them and arming them with that, that patchability knowledge and starting to bring that into the conversation that just because it's a CVSS 10 and CISA put it out, doesn't mean it you can do anything practical with it. Um, exploitability kind of gets into the techno geeky nerd stuff, but I think that's important too, because again, the idea is that we're looking to reduce, not just the risk, that's like a CISO term, a CFO term, but to reduce the impact, right? I mean, we're here to reduce impact to operations. So if something's not exploitable, uh, then it's not gonna be impacted by operations. and I think we do see this churn more so now than others, now that security vendors are getting involved. They'll put out, hey, we discovered 100 CVEs this year. And you're kind of sitting there thinking, well, I'm not a big fan of like uh, security by obscurity, but I have a feeling you just created these CVEs so you could write detections for your own product and kind of push your market value. No one was ever going to exploit this Inkscape thing. Like, you know, like it practically. Um, and it's hard because you don't want to get too jaded with that, but it's just like, okay, so come to the table with those things that would have made it difficult for an attacker to actually exploit this, or at least bring the context so that now why asset owners could determine, is this worth my time? Um, and then the final is criticality. And unfortunately, like we were talking before, uh, CVSS is here to stay. I don't think the community creating yet another version of scoring is going to- An ICS CVSS? <laughs> And ICS CVSS, and uh, you know that's like the old XKCD. Like now we have thirteen standards. You know, it's just like oh. Um, so it is a good first pass. Hey, let's look at the highs, criticals, highs, mediums, lows. Um, 
just understanding the nuance in CVSS, how it's formed, the fact that it's uh, kind of based in enterprise, and also that the researchers and OEMs get to just arbitrarily tick the boxes. So a little more scrutiny there. Not all asset owners have that time, but as you're going through the critical ones, if you start to apply the lens of, you know, is it applicable, is it patchable, and is it exploitable, then all of your tens may not all be equal. And that could help influence uh, a more efficient kind of reduction of impact. Awesome. That's great. So I've, I've driven the conversation, Ron. Is there anything mm -hmm. that I've uh, forgotten to, uh, uh, you know, kind of steer us towards? No, I, um, it's, it's a be careful what you wish for. I love the reports. I love, I actually like the logos and the, and the, and the names. What I don't like is when uh, asset owners feel like they're just on a constant go rope, right? Mm -hmm. Constantly chasing, uh, sitting there waiting for the next big report to come out in fire drill. So I think it's good that this research is more uh, standard. We don't have cease and desists and people at DEF CON getting pulled off stage anymore, right? Um, so we're maturing as a, as a, a community, but I think it's good to have this context of, you know, hey, you know, industrial is different. How can we empower them to actually implement these things that we're disclosing? Because that's really the end goal. It's not to have a cool report. It's to reduce the potential impact in our operations. Yeah. And in my mind, the reason why I'm in this is to our societies, you know, and exactly. not just the U.S. society, you know, uh, around the world. Yeah. Uh, Ron, this is uh, this has been fabulous. It's uh, um it's it's awesome. Uh, so, can you tell people where to find you? Uh, and uh, you know, and, and actually, go ahead. Please describe. I, you know, uh, help us understand what Sin Saber uh, is real quick. Just sure. Yeah. So, um, I'm online, Ron underscore Fab on Twitter. Um, yeah, I'm not as active on Twitter as others, but uh, you know, now that you know, co-founder of Sin Saber, I'm, I'm trying to have more more okay. social presence. But no, Sin Saber was born out of this idea that uh, OT monitoring is here to stay. Um, and, and we have predecessors and current solutions that have kind of paved the road for the market. You know, we're no longer uh, convincing people that they need to monitor their system. So it's about execution, almost like with vulnerabilities. It's all about execution now. And what Sin Saber is here to do is one, empower the operator to feel like they have control over their security telemetry. Uh, you know, a lot of times it's difficult with current solutions where it's hard to deploy or, hey, I have a rule or an analytic that matters to me. How do I get that into my system? Um, and it's this idea that you need a whole other SIM for ICS and then a whole other SIM for enterprise. So SimSaver's focus in a nutshell is to empower the operator and to do that by scalable monitoring. You know, um, I mentioned substations before. We used to say, well, Crown Jewels analysis, you don't need to monitor every substation, just monitor the power plants and the control centers. And what I started to realize what we were saying was, hey, we don't have the technology that's cost effective and scalable enough for you to monitor everything because if you're to ask a power flow guy, you know, give me your top 10 most important substations. He'll say, well, they're all important. We don't build substations unless we need them, right? right. Um, and so even me as a young security guy, that was hard to understand. I'd be like, well, no, obviously one has to be more important than the other. What about the one that's feeding the hospital? And, and it's just like, no, no, no. So that's really what we're focused on is providing that technology, let them have more control over their security journey. And, and that's really the focus. So that, that's what gets me up in the morning still. You know, I don't, I don't hack substations anymore and uh, I sort of miss it, but yeah, no, it's, it, it's great to be from this side of the community trying to help the asset owners with technology. That's awesome. And I really appreciate it. We'll make sure that we put uh, um, the information uh, um, in the show oh, notes. Yeah. And uh, so if anybody has any questions, they can reach out to you. But once again, Ron, uh, excellent conversation. I really appreciate your time and I hope you have a great weekend. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for tuning in to another concept overview with the SANS ICS and Cutaway Security Teams. Please let us know if there are other topics you would like us to cover in the comments below. If you enjoyed the content, please be sure to like and subscribe to the SANS ICS YouTube channel. This has been Don C. Weber of Cutaway Security. Go forth and do good things.